This is the Massive Wiki Wednesday uh, call for Wednesday, uh, February 2nd, 2022. Phil's uh, showing um, a scalpel diagram. Yeah, so I'm calling this thing System Conceptual Integrity, which I was doing some research in the dictionary about integrity in the sense of something being an unbroken or intact condition, like um, amongst various models. So there's customers and people who make need to make use of a system, you know, like an ATM or for me, you know, trying to pay my bill at the hospital, whatever, whoever is doing, doing their billing. Then there's people I need to call because it didn't work or email or something. So those people have a, their own model, which is my wife pointed out, yeah, they could just be following a script, but she used the nice term service level as being slightly different than me, just as somebody trying to like get something done. Then Dennis and I were talking, he goes, Dennis said, yeah, then there's the database system that has the operational ground truth about the content and status of the system. Whether it's a useful or not, to me, trying to pay my bill is different. And then I mentioned to him that, yes, and then on the other side of the database system are the people who actually architect and designed and wrote the code that actually instantiates this system. And I was reminded of that model because Bertrand Meyer in one of his books about C++ in the preface had this really interesting distinction. Be he was pushing back on people creating a lot of, uh, saying things like in the program, you know, I'm building an address book. This is my example. It's like, Bertrand Meyer would say, no, address book isn't available to you in C++. You've got variables, linked lists, structs, all this other stuff. There isn't an address book there. An address book is something humans use, you know, which could contain addresses. When they were in paper, I used to cross them out. I used to make notes. It was all kinds of stuff that I can't quite do in my contact list. So there, to me, there's like, in order for systems to be usable, for those of us on the outside of the programming, there's something about these, there are different models that people have, like the designers have a model of what they're building. And so here's an example. We just had to like replace a thermostat on a new system. My wife has an app on her phone, you know, for here's how you operate the things at home. So now what she had, so we had thermostat one, thermostat two, and, therm and now the new one, thermostat three. So there is no way for her to update the data in this app. She's got to delete the app, reinstall the app, then reconnect it with the two thermostats. Because whoever designed this thing never thought there'd be like somebody who would have to like, I don't know, replace a thermostat with another unit that's got to, you know, a different Mac address. I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, so this is the thing I've been trying to, to, I'm starting to try to work on. So I don't know if this is of any interest, but I'm finding it kind of useful because as my friend Dennis and I, as Dennis said yesterday, because he's having trouble in Seattle with his wife has a business and he has a business and they change some of the rules and stuff that's moved to the state, but it's handled locally. And it's like, he said, yeah, it's just getting worse for him. I, th I think that's a really good observation, Bill. I, and, and a lot of the problems I see people have is, uh, you know, model, model mis-expectation or, you know, whatever. We, I mean, we've seen that a bunch of massive wiki. We've seen it with Obsidian. We've seen it with Git. We've seen it. <laughs> it's like okay so i think how this works is you know and it's like no 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 that's that's a good, that was a good guess but <laughs> well and so yeah, you know, for me as a user and dennis and i dennis has talked about this for a long time because we were he was doing a lot of work on uh, on uh, on standards and stuff and it was uh, like when, when i have a breakdown in a system you know then all of a sudden it's like wait, I didn't expect that to happen when I click this button. Oh. I expected to see, you know, transaction yeah. completed. Yeah. 
he had a model of how it was going and then all of a sudden boom so the question is you know dennis and i was using a term called confirmable experiences and he was in because he was in this you know people he was doing some with open office he was doing some support and people used to say well you know i don't have that problem and dennis used to get furious he goes it's not about you this user outside has a problem works for me is not the answer <laughs> You know, so I think, I don't know, I think there's something here that's, uh, you know, because the people writing the code often are insulated from the actual experience of people that, you know, put it in day-to-day -day use. There's, there's also a weird thing where the people writing the code know, like, kind of the notional model, and then they actually know the operational model underneath the notional model. And then like maybe a customer support person knows the notional model and is explaining stuff to the customer. And then the customer says, but <laughs> my, my thermostat isn't learning. <laughs> and it's like, that can't happen. You know, and, and if you talk to an engineer, the engineer would go, oh, well, yeah, okay. I, I understand, you know, there's, the, we, we actually lied when we talked about the notional model, there's actually more complexity that, you know, that you don't want to know as a, as a normal customer support person. But but anyway, I, I think another part of that model thing is the three of us are, are particularly good, I think, um, and many of the folks we know are particularly good at, at learning new, a new system. But a lot of that learning a new system is knowing that knowing that you need a model for the, how it operates and coming in and not presupposing one is I think something that we do. So it was really interesting, um, Bill, when you when you said, oh, this Cosma thing looks really interesting, um, you didn't say, I, I fired up this Cosma thing and I can't figure it out, you know? I haven't done like, that yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get there. Um, but, but I guess, I, so another, another thing, thinking about that, that model thing is that you, like each of us, we've got, okay, so I'm gonna, I, I think this is a social network, so I'm gonna model it as a social network and, and we'll come into it that way. Or I think this is an integrated development environment. And you know, if I start with that kind of template, then you know, I can kind of step my way into it. Or I, I think it's, a, it's, maybe it's a V8 engine, you know, and I'm going to like work with it and like it's a V8 engine until I get surprised, right? So um, the, there's a, one of the things, I, 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 I work with people who don't, have good ways of learning new technology. And a lot of it is they, they don't understand that you need a, a model for how this thing works before you can start working with it, right? And so they, they, they like everything is new to them um, or they have kind of a, they don't have a good pattern library of models. And so they pick, you know, well, it's gonna work like, you know, like my stove or it's gonna work like uh, my lawnmower. And other than that, you know, <laughs> If it's not doing the things the stove or lawnmower would do, I don't know how to figure it out, you know. Yeah, so I think that's a breakdown from people doing the design implementation of yeah. the systems. Yeah. Right. For me, I, you know, one reason for me, like public key encryption has taken off and using, you know, yeah. is because I said, no, people have an idea how to use a key and lock their house. Yeah. This thing with the email thing and locking and blah, 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 and private, it's like, <laughs> Until it's easier, no one is really going to be able to make use of it. Yeah. And, and a lot of it and is literally, how you the, they just yeah. literally will not be able to make use of it. <laughs> and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, helping people use technology is, is, is being really clear about the, the model that you need to have to use it. Yeah. And I think that's not so easy. No, it's and really people, hard. I mean, I think that well, the gift. I think people would be are well. I think this whole thing about models is an interesting discussion, just from a pedagogical point of view. But um, I think people, if they were queried about stuff, like even a mechanic working on a car engine, they had they know that there's something going on in their brain that goes, "Hmm, I think I'm going to look over here." Yeah. <laughs> something can it be a, why uh i don't know i have a hunch yeah but they're really you know and the idea that well you're working off that's i think they know that there's they're doing something's happening there yeah that they have put together for themselves yeah so when they're looking at this you know four-wheeled monster they 
have a clue yeah. <laughs> where to start. I, so so the, the, the model that they're working with in their head isn't something that got drawn as a graph um, or you know, a, a set of manuals or something like that. It's, it's been, they've, they've got a map in their head of how all this, this works together. And they've probably never even verbalized, you know, the whole thing or, or drawn it out in, in particular. Yeah. Maybe they've chatted it out with fellow yeah. people working on cars. Like, yeah. here's how I think about this, yeah. this ridiculous, like, you know, braking system, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. When you hear that kind of hissing, it's probably the carb and it's not the tranny, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, but I think this is the this kind of what we what systems need is a certain, I guess a, what Dennis and I are calling it is a conceptual integrity of the models across in these different these different areas. Yep. And part of the breakdowns that like I have with systems is that either what's been designed isn't. Does it provide me enough confirmable, reproducible experience to actually put together a model I can work with or feel comfortable, you know? So I'm, you know, so I'm more wary. Like, I wonder what I feel this way with FedWiki because I don't really understand. I'm like, I don't really know what's going to happen here. Now, Massive Wiki is totally different because, like, this, like you and I, have, built it from the ground up and obsidian and like, I have a pretty good idea when I click on this new note thing, what's going to happen. Fedwiki is a really good example because it, it breaks a lot of uh, expectations kind of, you know, like where is this page and you know, what, what's serving this page and how do I interact with this page to do stuff? That's all my questions, which is why I haven't gone any further than I have, because I'm like, I think I need more than, uh, you know, an hour this afternoon to get through this. <laughs> um, anyway, hey, so, hi, Stacy. So I think I'll probably go to work some more on this little diagram and uh, post it somewhere. I don't know where it should go, but I don't know. Do you think that's, does it have some value? I'm oh, finding yeah. it. That's all a right. ton. Yeah. I don't know where it goes either. It could go massive wiki. It could go in maps and mapping. Oh, mapping. Kind of... Mappings is interesting because mappings have their own issues with what's yeah. being drawn and what's being inferred. With the... yeah. Um, Jack is Jack knows massive wiki is cool, and he's been wanting to know more about massive wiki. So maybe we'll end up talking about massive wiki. So. And then Bill and I have been the we we can talk about the what we're what we've been working on for a few weeks, which is uh, syncing via sync thing and uh, recent changes with page names, which I have to tell you <laughs> is leading me further away from Flask and AP Scheduler, for at least sure. for what I need to do to develop little you know. Yeah, fair repeated enough. modifications in text files. I think I'm just going to write a cron job from my own computer because <laughs> the, there's some conflict going on with Flask, AP Scheduler, which thread. I'm like, this is a lot harder yeah. to do than what I need right here. If, if only you had a model of how all the threads and stuff worked. And... <laughs> Correct. And maybe you do. I, so I, I think we may that. run into a problem with trying to add um, your like right the, the read, same thing, yeah. right the page news thing in flat. I don't know how I don't know what to do with this because the cron thing is not reliable. It misses even the, the, on the it just misses AP schedule. It, uh, yes, an AP schedule it just like yeah. misses. You know, yeah. out of eight times, it misses six times. I'm like, and then yeah. it doesn't. Of course, doesn't do it. I'm like. There's nothing running. I don't have, you know. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to play with it more. I haven't played with it more. And it, it sounds like, oh, that sounds like it would be simple to figure out. It's probably well, maybe not. if you and I can get that's a separate, you know, yeah. code thing. But I am really frustrated because it's like I. Um, to, to, uh, to, to 
level out the level up the conversation or something like that. The the thing that Bill and I we're, we're talking about and we're like deep in the weeds of engineering crap, but um, <clears throat> basically it turned out that one of the um, uh, we we never because we kind of backed into the fact that it, it was a wiki just by starting with files um, uh, and a way to make the files you know um, replicate from computer to computer. Um, uh, we never had we never had like a a wiki server back in the day. The wiki server was the thing you wrote. You wrote a little application that that said, oh somebody's you know somebody wants to see a wiki page. Let me go grab the wiki page from the file system and show it to them. So once you've got an application like that, it's really, really straightforward to say, you know, it would be really cool to see what's changed recently, the recent changes. So that was a, a default feature of all wiki scripts, you know, from the very beginning. So um, we never, we never really developed that because I don't know, we, it, it wasn't some, it, we didn't have a place to put it, I guess, actually, that's actually a really good, um, uh, so anyway, and there was a way to get around it. You could look at the Git logs or whatever you really needed to. But it turns out that um, so Bill and I are also playing around with replicating the files better using sync thing. So now we've got it set up. So I've got a massive wiki on my computer. Bill's got a massive wiki on his computer. If he make changes, they they happen in mine. And if I make changes in mine, it happens on his. Um, we're starting to get Michael sucked into this this uh, deal too. Um, but then. Then the next bit is like, oh, you know, Bill's, I, and there's no reason for me to go visit the wiki because it's just lying there on my computer, you know, and Bill makes a bunch of changes and I have no clue that he's made them and vice versa, right? So we kind of backed into the realization that recent changes is a super critical part <laughs> of a social wiki. It's not a super critical part of a personal wiki because if you're just the only person using it, you know, I know what changed. But as soon as you have, two people using it then it's like i have no idea what's going on unless there's something that tells me so we started writing um an application that will show you you know what's what's new basically um so and then we're having all kinds of fun doing that <laughs> because of the tool the tooling um yeah that's really if you want to go deeper we can talk about it but it's like yeah that's good enough. and and there's some there's some simplicity of deployment issues and stuff like that. So we've already gotten bit by the fact that um, Git is hard to set up on a new person's computer, um, and it's hard a hard model to understand. So we're a little bit shy about deploying. You know, saying, "Oh, all you have to do to use Massive Wiki, you know, you you can just use it with sync thing." But then, if you really want to use it, you want to use this page news app application, and then that's a whole. How are we going to get it installed? And then if we want to have something running, you know, every few minutes to check if there's anything new on the network of uh, the massive wiki stuff, you know, how do you make sure that gets installed? So we were trying to fold it all into one little into one little package, but Bill's like, the one little package does not work. Dude. <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. So he's talking about <laughs> making two things now, except that that would be uh, harder to install. <clears throat> Easy, yeah. easier to make it actually work so we're to the point where it's not quite working yet at all so having two things that work is better than one thing that doesn't work yeah well when you see pete's little newsletter i actually say we're still in the trial and error phase of development <laughs> I, I, I appreciated that bill when, when i saw it in the newsletter you know well-known well-known learning method <laughs> Um, Jack, I wonder if you have questions about Massive Wiki that we can help answer or get stumped on. I I don't really, per se. I mean, I can go and read the online docs. What I'm trying to do is just immerse in the in the lore, the the vocabulary, and the context. Yeah. Gotcha. It's so conceptually, it's super simple, and it's and and actually explaining it to somebody who's used to you know any of the tech involved it's it's embarrassing because it's just like if you you know just reading it out it's like okay there's nothing there you didn't innovate anything <laughs> there's literally you know i do this all the time at my work and i don't know i don't call it a wiki what's up with that but anyway it's super simple um, markdown pages in um in a repo 
or a vault. And, um, you know, it's nice to have a viewer for it, but like Obsidian, but you don't have to, you can use, um, I would use Emacs and, you know, whatever, um, double bracket links. And we started off with, so the, the massive part of it comes from an acronym, um, a, uh, M -A VSF, uh, a markdown, versioned shared files. So versioning and sharing, um, and then the fact that they're files rather than a whole data store or something like that. Um, those all have been important. Um, and so that was all, all, all of that structure was a good kind of first hypothesis. The, the next hypothesis that they should be shared and versioned with Git um, has bit us in the ass pretty hard um, over and over and over. Um, because Git is easy once, once you've got it installed on your computer and you have enough muscle memory to light, write it like a bike. Um, I don't think, I, I've actually seen Git experts. It really blows my mind that anybody can be an expert in Git. Git is this really hard tool or, or really amazing tool, really powerful tool. So um, it's kind of like somebody invented a bike, but then like, like welded on like, uh, a chassis from a Jeep and tank turret mounts and, and uh, wings and all kinds of crap. And, and so it's kind of like going into the garage and there's this like whole big collection of machinery that's all, you know, supposed to get you to the grocery store to get some groceries. And it's like, <laughs> how do you not cut yourself on the wing? And how do you like switch on the switch without burning yourself with some jet engine going off or something like that? It's insane. So, um, so you you know we we kind of set it up so a civilian can put on a, a blindfold or air goggles or something like that and walk in and it looks like a bike, <laughs> but um, you know, like getting into the garage uh, turned out to be a problem. Um, making sure they didn't trip over over some part that was sticking out was, was turned out to be a problem. Um, so Git was a an interesting guess and not the best one for getting us going. Um, so we've come up with a, a bunch of ways around that. Actually, my favorite, Jack, is it's kind of funny. There's a, uh, a, a native JavaScript uh, Git implementation that I figured we could fold into an Electron application. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's all actually, that's, I think that would be decent because for me, the thing that we ran into with Git, even though we wrote instructions that would help somebody new get it up get the whole thing up and running using Obsidian, you know, either on Windows or a Mac, um, you know, it's still, in order for the poor person to actually have a workable, reliable model for themselves. So when they sit down, they have some idea what happens when they push these buttons. I think it really is a lot to ask and it's a lot of friction doesn't contribute to yeah. sharing information in files and keeping track of versions of them. So sync thing is working really well for us. My, Except my for the versioning thing. <laughs> so the, I just want the, the funny thing about sync thing is you run this little tiny little server on your own system, right? So you're part of your peer in this network. It's well, Michael set it up. It's a little geeky to set up, but it's self-contained. Once it's running, it's running. Um, but like, if I restart my computer and I go, what's changed? It says nothing because it just erased everything it had been tracking because, Hey, you started me up all over again. So it's like, oh, there's nothing persistent here. <laughs> so that's kind of where we're stuck now with, oh, great. <laughs> so, so, and then with Git, what I was hoping to get to, I thought the, the Git part would be easy. You know, I thought, I don't know. I was on drugs, um, uh, but but then the thing that I was really looking forward to was the GitHub style uh, collaboration stuff, where you've got forks and pulls and branches and and pull requests and uh, you know, and then also the the cool like conversational stuff that happens around check-ins and branches and you know merges and stuff. So I was I was like. Oh, the Git stuff will be easy, and that and that will be the hard part, right? And and it, it it will be hard when if and when we ever get to that. But but on the other hand, I you know I've I've worked with a bunch of developers coming up through, I I don't know it's it's actually not that hard to do the GitHub style collaboration. Here's Pete, Pete again saying it's not that hard. 
Um, but it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel hard. It's not harder than, you know, it's not really harder than using a mailing list or, or Mattermost or whatever. Well, you, you wouldn't expect high school science teachers to come up to speed on Git anytime soon. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I, I, work... I, I would. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, I'm, no, I, I would like... because I, when I was in grad school, I used to teach. I got, you know, made money by teaching these summer classes at the university for high school, you know, chemistry teachers, and they were pretty sharp, actually. And and it's it's an interesting question whether you're talking about high school teachers or high school students, because a lot of the students are sharper than the teachers. Um, I, well, I, I've got uh, a. I, re I, I resemble every mark, man. Sir. I, I have a neighbor who was a teacher, science teacher, who moved out of the state when they told her that she had to get the, uh, the vaccination. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't expect her to, 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 to come up yeah, to that. Um, you know, he, Massive Wiki really does remind me of FedWiki. I mean, it's clear that FedWikis, you 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 followed, you followed Sorry. FedWiki long enough to be inspired by it. It's the idea that you 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 can just grab a paragraph out of a FedWiki and yank it into yours, and this this whole swapping information thing. It's very incestuous and a lot of fun, but uh, it, you have to build a farm to do it. You know, yeah. uh, Marc Antoine put up a farm and I've been in a few others and and they're amusing, but um, it's it's a different it's it's a to me, it's a different take on this thing I call federation sharing. Um, I, I mean, I, I came up uh, uh, in federation uh, while doing a PhD, I just realized I, I'd been in topic maps for a bunch of years and I was doing this PhD and I just realized, my God, um, we can use topic maps to federate stuff because that's what they do, except we didn't think of them that way. It were Mostly they were thought of as index of a back of a book. That was the idea. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I keep thinking about federation and then I, I wonder about massive wiki. There's a difference between literally federating the way I think about it and the way Ward Cunningham and, and, and massive wiki, you're, you're, you're closer to swapping and aggregating more than, than, to me, federation implies that there's some kind of knowledge organization going on that you, that you're, that you're, you know, you're putting things in the bins where they belong, that sort of thing. I, that's, that's a really good point. And my experience with social text, especially the, the social text corp wiki, our internal wiki, was, <laughs> and, and, you know, and related ones around that kind of, um, was that uh, the, the organization putting it in the right buckets and stuff is, is something that well, a, a couple things occur to me all at once. One of them is it turns out that most people don't have a librarian mindset, which is fine. Um, and some people do. Um, most people don't have the wiki gardening mindset and some people do, and that's fine. It, so it turns out there's a long tail of people who do information architecture and reorganizing and, and just general tidying up. Not everybody has housekeeping mind. Um, um, uh, but, also, um, it seemed it seemed at the time social text seemed really easy that you would. I it it felt to me like there was kind of a body language thing that happened, and and it it kind of mirrors the way people work in conversations. Um, uh, people are actually really good in a conversation at like taking turns, picking up where somebody left off. Um, butting in gently with a new topic, um, at least people who, who are, are good at the sociality of, of you know, a, a group of people talking. Um, and a lot of that is organizational stuff, right? It's like, what are we talking about now? What do I want to talk about next? What did she want to talk about that I know that she wants to talk about, but she's not going to mention, you know, all of that stuff. It, it seemed to map like that kind of stuff or that 
that facility with it, which I think is is mostly wired in. Um, uh, it kind of did the you know the wiki worked that way too. So in the wiki, I would do something you know on purpose, or there were a few other people. The the, the gardeners would decide, oh well, it turns out we should have this as kind of the way we set up page titles, or when we group together topics, we should do it a certain way and put a, an index page or whatever we decided to do, right? Um, we, we kind of, we played around a lot with the, the idea of talk pages and how to do that too. The Wikipedia way of doing it is one kind of clunky way and it, and it kind of works, but we came up with a bunch of other ways that you would have converse, meta conversation, right? All of that stuff, you like it, it didn't happen automatically, but the wiki gardeners doing it was enough for people to follow along um, and and you know innovate in, in even the people who weren't wiki gardeners would innovate stuff and they would say, well, I, we're gonna you know I, I'm I'm creating workflows and so you know here's how I how I do a work. We had a one customer who was um, a print shop. And somebody invented a workflow management system um, for jobs um, in the wiki in text, you know, um, and it worked great. And so, so point taken that that federation kind of is a you, you do need organizational stuff going on too. But the wiki style of doing that, it, it seemed like it worked pretty well. That it was you you would kind of emerge into organization rather than doing organization a priori, if that makes sense. So then, but then there's, you know, thinking about Ward Cunningham's, he has this thing where you drag a whole paragraph from my wiki to your wiki or yeah. whatever. And in terms of, of disk space, you're just multiplying the amount of stuff. Yeah. Whereas, Ted Nelson would have said, no, you just grab a URL and transclude it. And now yeah. you've got it. It's there. You can use it. You can play with it, whatever. Um, but then that begs the question about versioning, because in transclusion, you can only mess with the original, not the, not the, the clones. And yep. so this is a really, really interesting space. I, I, I like the... Um... Promiscuity is not the right word. I like the um, the duplication and reduplication that's kind of built into the idea of massive wiki. It's 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 even more kind of than than fed wiki, um, and that's either better or worse or both. It's actually better and worse. But the idea of massive wiki, and we've seen a little bit of it. It's like yeah, make another copy of it, make another copy of it, you know. And it's like the the database oriented people. It's like, but how would I find the original? And it's like yeah, I you know I don't, it it doesn't matter too much. The 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 way it, it that seems to mirror the way people work in the real world, right? Um, if you tell a story to somebody, um, you know, and they tell the story to somebody, and they tell the story to somebody, you know, you don't end up with this chain of attribution, and you don't, you know, whatever, and it, people embellish it and stuff like that. So I, I there's good and bad things about that, um, but I like it in general. Um, uh, and we don't have to worry about disk space. Uh, there was some other part of that. Um, uh, replication by gossip kind of, you know, I totally forgot it. Um, oh, I, you know, the, the other thing that I'm looking forward to that we haven't seen yet is that's also, that's also kind of the way uh, natural selection works, right? Variation and, and, and selection. So it, it would uh, make some people unhappy to see, you know, like a story or something start in one place and not be replicated perfectly. But on the other hand, I would love to see stories start to merge and get selected for because this is a better story than that story and stuff like that. Um, I think that's, you know, that's the way humanity has worked for a long time and uh, informationally. And um, I think we we went overboard in in kind of making um, structure and especially property rights and stuff like that um, with human knowledge and human culture. So I, I like that massive wiki is messy and stuff. Findability will always be an issue. Well, 
kind of like disk space, right? Um, disk space is not really an issue anymore. Findability is, it's not quite as easy as disk space, but there's a bunch of search tools and we're getting better at them all the time. And, you know, it, it won't be, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know if this will actually happen, but um, it would be pretty easy in a few years to have an AI thing where you have a conversational thing. I'm looking for that thing about, you know, um, I was, I was talking to Mary at the beach and, you know, it's like, oh, do you mean, you know, this, you know, just <clears throat> the, the, the uh, sons and daughters of GPT-3 will be able to, you know, kind of like help you figure stuff out and find it for you. And so <clears throat> the, the, the related thing is um, purview and access and stuff like that, right? When when a story starts duplicating itself across a, a network and falls behind, uh, uh, falls into a walled garden or something like that, you know, um, the, the best AIs aren't going to find it because they don't have access to it. So that's that's an interesting problem. Just you know, how to keep things moving around and incentivize sharing them and and making lots of copies, but not keep not hiding them and not locking them up with IP law. We started off a little. This reminded me of a book that I have downstairs. I got to go look up, but. Uh... I think Jonathan Rosen in 2002 or three wrote a book called the, called the Talmud and the Internet, which is a really was I, at the time really affecting me. I thought it was really interesting, but partially about the Talmud being this like, you know, interpreted and reinterpreted and yet reinterpreted and then, hey, let's do another reinterpretation. And this is a totally association from this that when I was studying the semantic web, um, from Hellman and Almang's book on ontology design, you know, Jim Hellman writes, they're right in the beginning that the, the problem with like people saying on the semantic web, all we need is like, we'll just define things. He says, that's a world where anybody can say anything about any topic at any time. And the second thing is, you know, names. Well, yeah, they're all local. I mean, pretty much. And my joke about the semantic web once when I was teaching it was said, you got to put your Miriam Webster's book down. You got to leave that behind because it's Alice in Wonderland in there. <laughs> so there's something about how we connect and to get back to what you have to talk about, you know, doing this topic, this whole, I don't know, it's still, I feel like we're really as, a, you know, and in a very much, uh, nascent exploratory phase here about trying to settle some of these issues about who owns what, who can say what about what, how do we keep the, the, the so-called original, right? And what about the copies and the comments about the copies? And, and how do we, like Jackie brought up, the other day about trying to use you know memex or hypothesis to try and really annotate some of the quite rich conversations that are happening i mean i find it disappointing they're happening on the google mail list which is just a monstrous black box from the outside technologically i mean i can't you know bill anderson's you know reduced to forwarding individual messages from that google group to my own mailbox or I can actually possibly do something with them. Um, anyway, I just, uh, I'm feeling it's very, uh, we don't know what we're doing yet, maybe. Well, I certainly don't know what I'm doing, so. Yeah, still trying to figure out what we're doing.
David Glertner in his book, The Muse and the Machine said that the Talmud is the original hypertext document. So by the way, if, if you didn't know it, David Glertner was one of the Unabomber victims. He got a lot of his face blown off and one of his hands. So he taught himself to, to write and paint left-handed and continued and continued on. Mm. I, I kind of hate, hate to yank the conversation around, but I think I might. Um, uh, the, the newsletter is going out in a few hours, um, and um, and I in particular wanted to to get uh, Jack maybe a little bit more direction about um, the section that that um, you've got stuff in, if that would be okay, and with okay with everybody else. I gave you some comments. I don't I don't know what you're going to do with them. Yeah, I I ended up turning them into. Uh, seeds of seeds of news items and i i think i i'm not sure where to go with them <laughs> so um so that's why i asked let me share my screen real quick and i guess well, i'll share my screen first um this doc is also um I, I literally just uh, just in the past minute or two got a, a good question from Vincent is adding has added this stuff in the last half hour uh, or fleshed it out. He just has a, a couple bullets here, um, but he said I didn't see any any pictures, so I didn't put any pictures. So I'm like, dude, I'm going to add some pictures. Just put some pictures. Um, but anyway, I I think it would be so the 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 gist of this is or the Actually, let me walk through this real quick, and then, and then, um, so uh, there's a headline and and some stuff, right? So the OGM forum is going away. Um, we started the sense doing channel. The money and value conversation is is bumping along, and we're thinking of creating a Mattermost channel for it. What do you think? Um, Bentley and Jerry are working on a front end, some, a, a really lightweight read only um, front end for. Um, Jerry's brain, et cetera, et cetera. So just, you know, like, here's the, here's kind of what's going on. Here's the gossip, you know, that we don't have a good way of gossiping around uh, right now. And so this is just meant to take the place of the water cooler or whatever. So Jack, it seems like we should mention something about the work you're doing. And I'm not sure exactly what or how you want to name it or, or anything. Um, another thing might be to wait for um, it, it's totally fine to wait for two weeks. So we'll be doing this every two weeks. Well, so we have the little section on quests as a service. Um, I, let me just explain to you what's going on in my life. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a research guy. That's what I do. And so computers, computer augmentation of human research is, is really what I'm about. Uh, and and I I'm 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 able to make the claim that that um, that it saved my life. I mean, I was diagnosed with a leukemia at about the same time I was getting started building a a program. It was called the the Scholar's Companion, and it was it was through trying to teach the program how it should think about biomedical research allowed me to do enough research to fire the doctor that diagnosed me. And, and, and that's 30, 33 years ago. So what I did, he was going to have me do a bone marrow transplant. And, and I said, no, you're not. And I ended up firing him. And, and that meant it's up to me. I'm on my own. Yep. So I had to do the research. And uh, what I did is I did enough research to trust other doctors. And the other doctors were, were you know, the, the, the people that, that, that helped me get here from there. Um, 
but when you're doing all of this research, you really need to organize all of this stuff and be able to wrap your head around it. You got to get the gestalt of it if if you're going to if you're going to save your life or your kid's life or whatever else. Um, and and so just writing notes in a journal, yeah, it helps, but it's not the whole story. So my big thing isn't quests as a service. That's that's a that's a service that sits on top of what Mark Antoine and I are working on, which he calls, uh, he calls uh, hy hyper-knowledge. And, and basically, hyper-knowledge is, is, was based on his study of topic maps from, from what I was telling him. And since Open Sherlock was a topic map platform that, that I built during my PhD research, um, that's, that's the real that's the charm that's the you know the a backside that really helps to organize and 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 uh to to sift through all of this tons of literature you know there's 22 million pubmed documents 50 percent of which have already been retracted and you have to be able to figure out which ones to throw out and which ones to study and it, it's it's a huge monster so my my real game is is it it is it is sense making in its largest sense, and I brought in game based because uh, a, a Carnegie Mellon professor asked the question once: How can we have a civil conversations online about about politics? And I, my answer was: World of Warcraft meets global sense making, and that's what where where this whole topic quest thing and QAAS got started. Um, so I changed the headline to game-based sense-making, and I think I'm just going to put a sentence um, like this. Jack and Mark Antoine are, are working at making tools and processes that would help lots more people navigate, discuss, and make sense of big, hairy topics. Learn more at, or join them, learn more, learn more, and at, and then I'm just going to put the a link to this channel. How does that sound? To which channel? Um, game based sense making. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that that that's you know that's the big story. That's what I do. Yep. Um, okay. Cool. Um, so maybe that's good enough. Thanks. Can I just say something since I'm sitting, I mean, obviously I can't add to your conversation, but I do want to throw one thing out. I was looking for a screenshot. Um, I'm really concerned like with misinformation and I don't know if you're aware of it, but like I Googled, can a man get pregnant? And I got research saying, yes, a man can get pregnant. And I was just looking, I'll send you that screenshot, but there's a lot of things like that. So I just wanted to throw that out there because when I first heard Bill and Pete talking. And again, I don't understand what you're talking about, but what came to me was there needs to maybe be a third place where that information goes through a few rounds before it. And again, I'm what leaving kind it. Of, what kind of information? When you were talking about when changes are made. Hmm. The, um, the, let me show you. Um, Uh, let me show you the, the thing that Bill and I are sharing. Um, um, so uh, how come the how come the YAML is showing up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, because I was, you know, I did I tried to follow our protocol for uh, adding um, making making comments. Is it oh because Live Preview has the YAML in it, I guess. Yeah, all oh, right, right. Um so so anyway, Stacey, if you can kind of imagine uh, the 
And so there's a bunch of stuff that seems important to um, me or important to, so here's a, a thing about copyright um, and other licenses. Um, uh, you know, here's uh, Ken's Facebook farewell. This is kind of like a little bulletin board where um, we have some books and it's kind of a, a strange story about why we have certain books here. But um, anyway, this is a little bulletin board that um, Bill and I post stuff that seems really important to us and, and we'd like to share, right? Um, it only goes between Bill and me right now and, and maybe Michael, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it doesn't, um, this one, this, this massive wiki, a, a lot of the other massive wikis are hooked up so that as soon as you save something, um, OGM wiki is like that, for instance. Um, uh, so in OGM wiki, um, you can go to the stewardship uh, section and look at uh, stewardship meetings we, we had, you know, um, in May last year or whatever, right? Or um, I don't know of a good example, but anyway, you know, you want to see more about Jerry. Um, so this one is set up that you edit it and it immediately goes, as soon as you, you click save and, and publish um, to your friends, it, you know, to OGM, it also goes up on the web. Um, uh, so that one is something where, where we are like you, like, like if somebody made a page in this one and said, yo, did you know uh, men can't pregnant? Um, you know, it would be on the web someplace. But the other one, the, so knowing about the changes and what's changed and what's going on. Um, so this is on the web and this is, you know, on my computer and Jerry's computer and a few other people's computer. This other one, the one that we've, we've kind of- um, Too adorable, I'm sorry, he's so cute. Yeah. Um, uh, Bill and I with, with I, and, and this seems a little bit more friendly, uh, even though the, the web thing is super useful. Um, uh, so, you know, if you, if you want to have kind of a blog, you could have a massive wiki and everything you save gets up on the web. So it's kind of a public blog, but you can also have a massive wiki that's just between friends. And this one actually seems more, more natural, more like the things you want to do. Right. Um, uh, so. Um, the, there's a couple other, like, um, over in the flotilla group where we talk about like emergent event sense making or, um, publishing stuff between massive wiki and trove and, and factor and all that kind of stuff. That's a, that's a place where it's a lot more critical that you have maybe, you know, um, checks and balances, maybe voting, you know, maybe reputation management around what gets posted and, you know, when you're sharing it, you know, whether or not it's some random piece of crap that, that, you know, maybe, maybe you want a warning even before you start to read it, and, or it's something that's been vetted by a whole bunch of people and, it, you know, it's really solid information. Thanks. It's a good reminder. Thanks. I, I was just wondering if you guys realize that the masses no longer really trust Wikipedia. Well, the, the masses no longer trust anything, right? Except the, the, the echo chamber they're in. And, and the echo chamber they're in, maybe science, maybe anti-science, maybe, well, you know. Yeah, well, I just, I just want to add that some of them have a reason to not you know, I just listened to um, a podcast my friend had done with Bob Saget, and he re-released it, you know, when he died. And, you know, Bob was just saying how many things were said wrong about him. So I, I just wanted to, you know, throw that out there. This, I, Wikipedia is an interesting, I, I got to watch Wikipedia grow up, right? And um, uh, I remember the first big um, totally false thing that got posted on Wikipedia about somebody pretty famous. Um, it was a politician or something. And Jimmy Wales had to wade in and, and talk about how Wikipedia works and things like that. Um, and then I think we've gotten pretty good. I don't know this to be true, but I think we've gotten pretty good over the past 20 years or whatever, teaching kids in school 
So you see something on Wikipedia. What do you do first? You go down to the sources, you check those sources, you, you know, just because it's just because it's on the web or just because it's on even Wikipedia, it doesn't mean that it's true. It means that it got there somehow, right? So um, the people I know that teach people about Wikipedia, that's kind of the first dig into it, right? It's like, so how did this information get here? And why do you think you should trust it? And, you know, should you trust it? So at least in some parts of, of society where, where they teach Wikipedia, it's not like, you know, this is God's gift or you know, the president's gift or whoever. Um, it's it's just a thing made by people, and you know the, and there are, especially on hot topics. You know, like um, pick your hot topic. Um, there's a f continual wars going on back and forth about you know what a page says about, um, you know about pregnancies or abortion or guns or whatever, right? There's a whole nother backstory to that, which is the, the social infrastructure and the bureaucracy to manage um, something, uh, a big information, a big contentious information space like Wikipedia is really a fascinating thing. Um, uh, they've, they've developed a lot of tools and practices and stuff like that. And a lot of them are not that great, but they're better than nothing kind of. I guess I just dream of a people powered, see something, say something place. Mm -hmm. I, there's, there's, there's kind of two things that one of the things that we've learned over the past two, three, four years, four years or so is that one of the things I learned is that there are professional misinformationists, right? There are forces in the world who want, you know, all of the United States to be tangled up on whether or not, you know, whatever, right? Whether or not we should get vaccines or not, right? Um, which, which, you know, like five years prior was not a contentious issue, but now it's a contentious issue because I, because the, the nation was manipulated into it being a contentious issue. Um, I distracted myself with that, that whole thing. There, but, um, but the other thing that turns out to be really interesting is there are different ground truths for different people. And, you know, there's, there's under all the layers of crap and bullshit and like, you know, intentional misinformation, you get down to ground truths about things. Um, <clears throat> a, a, a simple and, and useful example actually was, is uh, Wendy Alfred and I working on the Making Choices About Water website. If you're an indigenous person who's lived, you know, lived in the area for 20K years or something like that, or whose ancestors have lived there for 20K years, a rock has, you know, is, is, um, is a participant in the ecosystem, right? The river is a living thing. Literally, it's a living thing, right? Um, if you're a colonist who, whose ancestors have been there for 150, 200, 250 years, you look at the water and it's just a, a you know you look at the water and the river and it's a resource you know you go huh i could build a dam or i could divert it or i could you know i i could account for it in different ways so there's weird things happening for the indigenous people like um they've finally gotten you know water rights back uh, that they you know that they got they were taken away in the past 100 150 years they got water rights back but now there's no water to fulfill their water rights because upstream from that is some some other crap going on right um but anyway that that the the ground truth is literally different for an indigenous person and a colonist in australia about that river what it means what it is in life and stuff like that that's kind of a simple example but that's kind of also true about you know a bunch of other stuff and so and so then when you go to wikipedia and you know you say i wish the wikipedia page of that the Matawar river talked about it as a living being um, and you get other people going I want I think we should talk about water in general as a resource that can be you know um, owned added and subtracted it's like how do you represent both of those things on a wikipedia page right it's a difficult problem I'll just tell you I don't want to type this thing but just what you said about uh, indigenous people and water and you know living with rocks and stuff this is one of the primary arguments in Amitav Ghosh's latest book, The Nutmeg's Curse. Yeah. I mean, literally. I mean, literally. Yeah. 
about resurrecting some vitalist conceptions of the world rather than just a the materialist maybe is one yeah. one perspective yeah and and it's easy you know the it's easy for us maybe in materialist culture it's easy for us to go but it's ground truth that water is a resource i don't understand how it could be anything else you know um but you know so so and and so we've gotten the world to a certain place which maybe is not the best place you know if we had if we had a different ground truth maybe we would be in a better place right now in the world <laughs> literally <laughs> sorry <laughs> I'm gonna to have to jump off in a few minutes here. Yeah, it's but... probably good a good time to to wrap up. Any any final thoughts or questions or things you should talk about next time? No, I want to get in touch with you though. We gotta figure out, we gotta do a little bit of our own little design kibitzing about this uh, page news. Sounds good. Because the laboratory's a mess right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, thanks all. Thanks, Jack. See you around. Yeah, adios. <laughs>